Let's go back to it and we're going to review black body radiation. This is what um, I think I more or less kind of talked about this in the video that I posted uh, previously about um, the laws of radiation. But so the basic idea here is that the if you have any given object, um, there's, well, there's three different ways to interact with light, really four different ways. Um, but one of those ways, one of the ways to allow that object to begin giving off light is just to heat the damn thing up. And that's what we call black body radiation. If you heat an object up so much that it starts giving off light, the light that that object gives off obeys a very specific pattern that we call the black body spectrum. And there's a very precise mathematical uh, uh, equation that governs exactly how many photons that object will give off. And the, the single only variable that is the object's temperature. It makes no difference what chemical elements compose, com comprise it, I think that's right. So the, the chemical composition doesn't, doesn't change. The, um, well, obviously the temperature does, but the density of it, as long as it's relatively dense enough to view it as a solid, that, or even a liquid would, would work in this case, um, the density of it shouldn't make a difference. Um, nothing else about that other than the, and, and even like the basic color of it uh, shouldn't make a difference. Um, you know, you can heat a blue object up, a green object up, you know, as long as there is solid, like for example, a metal, you know, construction, nothing will change or nothing will affect the overall spectrum except for the temperature. And specifically, what we do is we graph the, uh, the wavelength versus the number of photons, which by the way, now you should see is the intensity. So if you can measure the intensity at each individual wavelength, we can make a graph. And by the way, we do this all the time in astronomy. Uh, what you do is you take a spectrometer and, and what that is, is a, well, I mean, literally a prism or a, a, a diffraction grating, which functions exactly like a, like a prism. And we know that when you pass light through a glass, you know, a, a, a triangular or a glass surface, the wavelengths bend differently. That's kind of cool. So the wavelengths go through that object and then they separate out. So what we, what we can do is when the, and I'll write this up here, um, I'll view it like a prism here though. So when you have light incoming to this prism, this is kind of the Pink Floyd drawing here. Uh, let's see. And I'm sure I'm gonna get the, the order of this wrong, which is bad for an astronomer, but this will bend something like this. The red light goes one way, the green light kind of goes in the middle and then the blue light goes over here, or it's entirely possible it's the opposite. So uh, I apologize that I can't say off, off the top of my head. And now what we do is we take a, let's see, we take typically along a kind of a circular axis here so that we maintain exactly the same distance from the light source or the wave fronts. You have a movable light sensor and based on how thin that light sensor is, the better wavelength resolution we can get. So for example, the, the thinner we get that, we might be able to sample wavelengths that are between, for example, 660 and 650 nanometers. So that'd be over here, red. So you can get a pretty narrow chunk of, of D theta, if you are, sorry, D lambda, if you think of it as a differential. And as you move that sensor down here, the wavelengths that you sample will go from the longer red wavelengths and then steadily as the, the smaller increments that you move that, the more and more precise measurements you can get of, basically we're dividing this into a, into a, a whole bunch of individual you know, compartments a la Riemann. And what we do is the intensity that that, that that sensor reads at a given angle here corresponds to the intensity of a precise wavelength. So let's say we happen to measure the wavelengths at 650 to 660 nanometers. And there's a very specific reason why I'm quoting that exact value. Let's say we get a huge amount of, of light. So we, we make a really big spiky mark here. I, I'm kind of, I'm gonna fill in the lines now as we go along. And let's say that we now, actually, I wanna go back on that one. We'll write the 656 later. Um, but so let's say we get a little bit of, of red light here. We don't get much. Now, as we move it, we get more and more closer to the green. And let's say by about this point here, 
the values that we're eating here, which are between about the green and blue, start to peak out. And then now as we move them fast, uh, sorry, lower, so they're rising and then they drop. So as we go to even shorter and shorter wavelengths, we see less and less. And this is exactly what happens in a lab. This is literally how at least we used to do it uh, uh, before modern lab equipment did this for us. But we can just move a detector around, sample different frequencies, and then we now have a nice, it's not quite a bell curve, it's a Planck curve. Um, hey Lenny, how you doing? And the one most important thing to measure that, as, as I've talked about before, is the peak wavelength or lambda max. And as it turns out, when, when you do this over and over, if you have a known temperature, so let's say this thing was coming from, let's say a lump of hot iron. Or some hot object. And specifically, we know the temperature T. Turns out that as the temperature increases, the temperature is inversely proportional to the wavelength. The higher the temperature, the sh and I should say lambda max, the higher the temperature, the shorter the peak wavelength. And precisely the equation that we have is what we call Wien's law now. Um, the, the temperature is directly equal to So if you measure the wavelength in nanometers, the temperature we want to measure in Kelvin. So this constant here, which the, you typically just see it written as a constant. Now, if anything, occasionally you'll see this written as B. So you might see, actually, I'll, I'll write it like that. Um, so we'll write it like this. The temperature is equal to B over lambda max, where B is just that proportionality constant or the inverse proportionality constant. Um, and we call it Wien's displacement constant. So B equals 2.9 times 10 to the six, or 2.9 million. Uh, and the units have to spit out Kelvin, and they have to cancel out nanometers. That. So by, by having those units there as, as it is, let's see. By having those units, we have Kelvin and nanometer on top. When you plug in nanometer for the, the units of wavelength on the bottom, the nanometers cancel out, and you get out the value of, in Kelvin. And you know, at this point, hopefully, you should be uh, familiar with using Kelvin for temperature. But the important thing is that it will never go negative. And the lowest it can get, the, the lowest this, this value can become, is approaching zero for larger and larger wavelengths. Or what that tells us is that the, the, um, the longer the wavelengths an object is emitting, the cooler it must be, the lower T goes. Hotter objects emit light with shorter wavelengths or blue light. So this is the direct way to gauge how hot anything is in the universe. As long as it's obeying the laws of black body radiation, which the easy way to tell is, does the graph look like that? And if it does, yes. If the graph looks like anything else, no. So you have to use other means. And there, there, are, there are, in fact, other means of measuring the temperature if you don't have that spectrum. And that's basically like many, many PhDs worth of, of information to store in your brain there. So I won't get into that. But OK, so um, this is the, the essential result of black body radiation, the, the essential law of it. We call it Wien's law. And the other important result is what we call Stefan's law. Which um, this, without going into too much detail, um, what Wien's law says is that the hotter an object is, the bluer it looks. Stefan's law says the hotter an object is, the brighter it is. And just to compare that, so two different effects. It gets brighter and bluer. And so therefore, we should know that, or we should be able to predict that the very hottest stars in the universe, for example, are the ones that are both very bright and very blue. However, that's problematic when we look up in the sky because it turns out the distance to a star tends to play a much greater role in how bright it appears than the actual luminosity. So, and, and by the way, I said the word, the word luminosity. Luminosity refers to the total amount of energy output by an object. And that's what I mean here. By when I say brighter, I mean the luminosity is greater.
And actually, why don't, why don't I define that? Luminosity, so it's the total amount of energy output or released by an object per second. And if you think about it, we measure energy in terms of, uh, sorry, in, we measure energy in terms of joules, the, the SI unit at least, uh, ergs for the, the non-SI people out there. But we measure energy in, in uh, joules. If you take, if you have an object whose luminosity is one joule per second, we know that as another unit. Joules per second is actually the same thing as watts. So it turns out the basic unit that we use for luminosity is just watts. It's a measure of power. So we measure it in watts. So luminosity is literally the same thing as the power of an object. How much energy per second does it output? And so Stefan's law specifically says the brighter an object, the greater the power. And just to kind of, and by the way, what, what that means for the graph, um, it's a little tough to do it here with a static whiteboard, but as if you, if you make the object, actually I'll just do this. If you make the object get hotter, that peak would move left. Or if you make it cooler, the peak moves right. So this will be an example of a very cool object. Not of any much radiation, not even enough to register here, but a little bit of light at the red wavelengths. For a hotter object, it's going to have a little more light at every wavelength, but it still peaks around maybe the green part. For the hottest object, if you combine the whole energy of this entire curve, or specifically if you integrate the blue curve, the total integrated energy across all wavelengths will multiply as the temperature to the fourth. And that's, that's, that's a really big deal. So that the energy or the power of an object, as predicted by Stefan's law, is dependent on t to the fourth. So if you double the temperature of a star, you quadruple. No, you, you, you 16 times its output. I don't know what's the word for that. So Stefan's law specifically says that the luminosity is proportional to t to the fourth. And so again, this is where we come up with the idea of that when you multiply t by a factor of two, the luminosity gets multiplied by a factor of two to the four, two, four, eight, 16. And that's why the entire graph has to move up as the peak moves left. So the result of this is when we look at a spectrum of light, if you're looking at the same object at two different temperatures, you can tell immediately what temperature it was at relative to the others just simply by how high it is. So even if we couldn't measure the, 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 where the peak is, if, it, if we know it's the same object, the hotter it gets, the overall higher the graph becomes. But if we're measuring two very different objects, the only way we have to relatively compare their temperature is simply just by where that peaks. And there's another, so for example, if you have a very nearby star, you're gonna get a whole lot more measured output of light. You're gonna see it as a lot brighter simply because it's near you but it might be a nearby cool star. So you might have a star that's very cool that looks very bright because it's near to you. You might have a, a star that's extremely hot, but it looks really dim because it's a long ways away from you. The only way we can, we can gauge how hot it is in this case here is by where that spectrum peaks, not how bright it appears. Okay, so specifically Stefan's law says that um, the intensity, which we define, by the way, as the luminosity per square meter or per, per unit area of the surface for, for a star, for example. So the intensity of light that something gives off, if you focus on a single square foot, square inch, square meter of, of an object or whatever it is, if you measure how much light that square foot gives off, that's what we call the intensity. So to be clear, the intensity equals the luminosity divided by the area. And these typically are the, the letters that we use in physics. Um, so again, this is just the definition. Intensity is the luminosity of an object, how much power it's giving up per square area of its surface. So if you double the temperature of an object, and, and actually, so I should correct this here. Um, the intensity 
is directly proportional to the fourth. But what I wrote there is still entirely right, because if you're taking an object, as long as you more or less leave it the same size, as you increase the temperature, the amount of energy per square meter rises, so the total energy output rises. So this is the proper way to say that. And so it turns out, when you identify exactly how to write this, um, this is, uh, here's the exact form of the law here. The intensity is equal to sigma, which is a constant times t to the fourth, where sigma is what we call Stefan's constant. So it's proportional to t to the fourth. Sigma is, um, uh, let's see, Stefan's constant. And it's equal to specifically 5.67 times 10 to the eight. So super easy to remember, which it doesn't explain why I forgot it. <laughs> uh, and the units are watts per square meter because that's what intensity is. So watts per square meter. Now it also has to cancel out the four units of Kelvin. So we need to put Kelvin to the fourth there. So you take whatever your temperature is in Kelvin to the fourth, that's gonna cancel that. And you output watts per square meter, which is what the units of intensity are. And there's your equation.